Welcome to the I Create Daily Podcast. I'm Leora Alderson. And I'm Devani Alderson. We're your co-hosts on this journey of creativity and productivity. I Create Daily is for artists in every genre of creating, from musicians to writers, crafters to inventors, bloggers to entrepreneurs. I Create Daily is a movement for creators serious about your art. If you're into creating anything, this podcast is definitely for you. Thank you so much for joining us on this journey. Hello and welcome to another episode of the I Create Daily podcast. I'm Devani. And I'm Leora. And this is a movement for creators serious about their art, which I (laughs) meant to say a minute ago. I'm glad you remembered to say that. Okay. And you're still Devani. Yes, I'm still Devani. And I'm still Leora. And our guest today is Angela Langlotz. She is a trademark and copyright attorney serving and educating clients in brand development, trademarks, and copyright. Angela helps online and bricks and mortar businesses protect their valuable brand identities and loves educating business leaders on copyright law through her extensive, informative, and entertaining video library on her website, trademarkdoctor.net. When not practicing trademark and copyright law, Angela enjoys cooking Italian and Spanish food, drinking wine, running, yoga, traveling, and hiking. Welcome, Angela. Well, thank you so much. I feel so very welcomed. (laughs) Well, you're beautiful, and you're not the typical stuffy attorney, and we're going to talk, look, look, and we're loving that, and we're going to talk about that, because we started talking before we started recording, and then we thought, we've got to stop talking, and we just need to start the show. So So why don't we take it from the beginning of your story of how you got into law and how you decided to focus specifically on trademark and copyright law. Okay, okay, sure. Well, I got into law because uh, I decided that I didn't want to go to medical school. (laughs) I, I actually have an undergraduate degree in biochemistry and microbiology with a minor in Latin American studies. And um, I decided that medicine seemed like it was going to be a real grind where there wasn't really an opportunity for me to to be creative. And so I decided to go to law school instead. And that's turned out to be a really, really great um, career choice for me and one that's afforded me a lot of freedom in how I practice and a lot of room to think outside the box. Mm -hmm. So when I first started my law practice, I mainly focused on business law and, um, you know, wealth, wealth transfers for, um, business owners and other wealthy families. And this is going to sound super flaky, but I'm just going to say it anyway. I really got tired of showing up in the office every day and putting on what I like to call the lawyer suit, right? So I had to drive 45 minutes each way uh, to the office. I had to show up. I had to put on the lawyer suit. And I got to tell you, it was just killing me. It was killing me. So uh, I was married at the time. I've been divorced for about six and a half years now. But I was married at the the time. And my husband, who was a patent attorney, said, listen, um, he was working at home and really enjoyed it. He said, listen, why don't you come home? And, you know, work from home and you can run the trademark practice. So, uh, you know, my specialty, don't hate, was the firearms industry. (laughs) Okay. And that seems really weird, but that is the practice niche that we chose. And we were wildly successful. And for about, you know, for a number of years, I was filing about 40% of the trademarks that got filed in International Class 13. And International Class 13 is basically things that blow up, right? <laughs> so firearms, ammunition, um, fireworks. Yeah. So I was filing. Just me. Just me. My little, my little practice was No, was it was filing. a more explosive job than your Right? Practice. It was an explosive job choice. <laughs> But anyway, so when I divorced, I basically gave him the law practice and started serving entrepreneurs, both, you know, online and brick and mortar. And I had been selling stuff online for a while, for a number of years. So I knew about the um, particular challenges that online business owners have. And I got quite a reputation in the online business community for kind of being the go-to trademark attorney. And here I am. Wow. Fantastic. So in 
I'm glad you said that about the lawyer suit because prior to that, you know, I indicated, you know, the stuffy corporator and, and I don't mean to degrade that at all because some people love that and mm -hmm. it works for them. Most people in, in our audience are creatives, which means they're artists, musicians, writers, but we also have entrepreneurs, inventors, people who create products and product developers. So mm -hmm. anyone creating something, but most of the things that, that most of what they have in common is they're working on their own, which means they don't yeah. have to show up to a corporation that has its dress code, you know, that you mm -hmm. have to, so, and, and most of us love that, you know, so yeah. yeah and I don't even think it's necessarily the clothing that we don't like. It's just everything that represents somebody else telling me how to live a majority of my work life. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, I mean, I hear you there. Um, I've been a solo practitioner since 2013, so quite a while now. And I just, I just really hated going to an office and having somebody else control my work environment, right? I mean, I was working at a law office once, and they had this really obnoxious intern. His desk was kind of in this vestibule slash hallway right outside my office, and he would come to work when I'm, you know, I'm trying to, like, draft documents and talk to clients, and he would come to work and play um, really obnoxious music, not on his headphones, but because he thought the rest of the office needed to hear it too, you know, on, on his computer speakers. And I basically just told the supervising attorney, listen, here's the deal. Um, either he stops doing it or I leave, you know, and that's just the way it is because I can't work under this, these circumstances. So, um, you know, I mean that, that whole situation just basically got intolerable for me. So I just said, you know, see you later. Bye. Doing I'm out of here. And started my own practice. He was fantastic. Sorry to interrupt you. So no, it's fine. So he was doing his creative thing, but it just wasn't the creative thing for everybody. Right. <laughs> right. Right. No, I mean, Hey, do your creative thing. Let your freak flag fly. Just not outside my office. <laughs> right. Exactly. Right, yeah. And now you have your own. So, um, I'm sure like, you know more than we do for sure. What kind of questions you get asked most off often by people who are trying to um, you know, to protect their, their work as well as concern that they might be infringing on somebody else's. And so we have se several angles we would like to expand on with you today. So the first was how you got to become a creative yourself and doing your own thing, entrepreneur working for yourself. And so we've touched on that. And mm -hmm. so then I think next, what mo our audience would need to know most is what they can do to protect their work. So here's an example of some things that have come up in our community, our Facebook community group. Mm -hmm. We have a um, we have a few people who well, we have a number of people who are writers. Like I said, we have one person who is a musician and uh, composer of music, as well as singer. Um, you're probably familiar with Gary Vaynerchuk. Um, oh yeah, and, yep. Um, so the the culture of today is produce lots and cop of content, document it and put it out there all the time as much mm -hmm. as you can. Mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of where we could start. It's like, what are the concerns? It's so different, right? Your industry would seem to be so different. And I would imagine as an entrepreneur, you've had to look at it with a different perspective than it might be looked at in corporate law. So could you take over here and just share your thoughts on that? Well, I, I think the big mistake that I see most people make when they, when they create something is that they don't go and look and see what else is, is being used out there. Um, you know, what else is being registered. So one of the biggest problems that people have is that they adopt names for their businesses or their, they adopt names for their products or other brand names and they don't bother to check and see if those brands are already registered. Right. Because if somebody else is already using it for similar goods, you can't use it. It's it's trademark infringement. Right. So so there's that. Another issue that I see a lot of is and, and you know, the Internet makes it so easy to copy other people's stuff. I see a lot of people getting into trouble copying other people's stuff, especially photographs off of the Internet and. I mean, the problem is that it's, like I said, it's so easy mm -hmm. and it's, I like to say that copyright infringement is kind of like speeding, right? So when the cop pulls you over and says, 
um, madam, <laughs> do you know how fast you were going? Yeah. Which you should never answer the cops' questions, just smile, right? Um, <laughs> they don't write you a ticket if you intended to speed, right? Intent is not part of the inquiry. The officer goes, the speed limit is 25, you were going 40, and I'm writing you up for going 15 over, here's your ticket. Same thing with copyright infringement. You copied my original work, and here's your demand letter for damages. Thank you very much, right? Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter if you intended to copy. It doesn't matter if you only copied like part of it. Um, it, doesn't, it doesn't matter, right? I mean, there are certain like circumstances under which you can copy, but that's without this conversation right now, okay? So um, don't copy other people's stuff. You will get into trouble for doing that. And um, the damages can be big, especially if the copyright is registered, the registrant, the copyright owner gets uh, statutory damages, okay? And, and they don't have to prove anything to get damages if the copyright is registered. So you could be on the hook for, you know, thousands and thousands of dollars worth of damages so, so there's even um, if that raises an interesting question so there's a lot of um like artists that put their work out on instagram or you know facebook or wherever online YouTube. online and um that's a huge volume of content being put out how do you how does one determine this is so i know that there's like the basic sort of creative commons law where if you make it and you put it out there it's yours based on the fact that you made it and so where it seems like some of the lines blur a little right. bit when you get into the amount of volume being put out by various creators online and you're obviously going to run into so like if if an artist draws a unicorn and puts it out online and somebody else draws something and it looks remotely similar and neither of them have an idea that the other exists like where where are some of those lines drawn and how does one protect their work in that environment if does that make sense i i'm not even sure if i'm asking the right question. yeah um there is so much wiggle room in copyright law so that's kind of a multi-part question so let me break it down i heard one of your questions was when i upload my content my my creative work to someplace like youtube or instagram or facebook what rights do i have to that content is that your question? That's one of them, yeah, for sure. Okay, okay, so we'll, we'll get to the other ones later. One, one, one question at a time. Yeah. Um, so you have to really look at the terms of, of service, right? So like for YouTube, for example, when you upload something to YouTube, as part of the terms of service, they require that you're granting YouTube a non-exclusive worldwide, worldwide, sorry, perpetual license to um, you know, redistribute that content and monetize it however they like. That doesn't mean that you still don't own it, okay? That doesn't mean that other people have a right to copy it. It just means that YouTube has the right, you've given them a license, all right? When, and think of, think of copyright rights, your rights as a creator, as kind of a bundle of sticks, right? Mm -hmm. So you have this bundle, of, of rights that you can give away. And when you license something, it's kind of like giving away a stick, right? So you're, you can give away that stick and if, you know, under certain terms, that's what a license is. You're basically giving somebody the right to use your content for a limited purpose. That's a license. And if you, if you want to, you can do that. And if you want to retain all your rights, you can do that. But you better make sure if you want to put your content out there on a platform that you don't own, you are granting that platform the right to use your content in a certain way. That's the only way you can get it on to their, their platform, right? I mean, you're basically giving them the right to, to you know, reproduce that or redistribute that for a certain, you know, a certain time. You have to go and read the terms of service, right? So I just talked about what YouTube's terms of service are. That doesn't mean that YouTube has the right to um, 
sell it. Well, I mean, are they selling it to other people? Kind of, they're selling advertising, but that doesn't mean that anybody else has the right to copy your stuff, right? I really think that everybody, if you want to, you know, retain the rights to your stuff, one of the things that you should do is put a watermark on it, mm -hmm. right? If you put a watermark on it, even if somebody else shares it, they're not going to be able to pass it off as yours. Or if they try to, it's got your watermark on it, right? Right. So all of the YouTube videos that I produce and the, the Facebook lives that I produce, they all have a lower third on them, has my name, has my website on it, has my logo on it, says that it's live, live video on it. I mean, if you wanted to, to chop that up and make it look really funny, I guess you could take all those things out, but you know, it would be difficult and a lot of trouble. And that's kind of the point. You want to make it difficult for people to steal your content and pass it off as their own and watermarking it makes it very difficult for them to do that. So I recommend certainly that everybody put a logo of some sort on their, um, on their material so that when it's downloaded, if it's downloaded or reshared or re-uploaded someplace else, at least they can't pass it off as yours. Now, arguably, if they download it and then uh, republish it someplace else. Is that copyright infringement? Yes, it could very well be. Oh, wow. So, it's like people who screenshot a photo from Instagram and then post it to their account again. I know a lot of people who do that. We've done it with our account, but we do. Is it different if you're actually sharing it with the intent of giving credit to everybody? Well, giving credit's very altruistic, but. Um, <laughs> I mean, again, you have to go to the terms of service, but absent any other term of service, I would say if you're reproducing somebody else's work and uploading it to your, um, your account, that could be copyright infringement, right? Mm -hmm. So, I, I mean, and like I said, it's so easy and we have this kind of online culture of sharing material online, mm -hmm. right? And, and for the purpose of, you know, maybe educating or illustrating, um, arguably that would all be covered under the fair use exception under copyright law. But I don't think that most people when they share content are really trying to steal from the original creator. Right. And if the content has my watermark on it, guess what? I'm probably not going to care that, um, that it's being shared because it, it reflects on me, right? It's already marked with my brand. So if people like it and they think it's cool, Guess who they're going to go see? Right. Definitely. Me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, exactly. so that's okay. Yeah. yeah. It's definitely an asset in that regard. But you can see why there's like so many intricate and uh, complicated issues around it because there's so many nuances to what's copywritten, uh, what levels of infringement have you broken, basically. And so it's, it's fascinating. Yeah, I mean, there is actually a lot of nuance to copyright law. I, I mean, it's it's a lot less cut and dried than than people think, right? Like even this whole fair use exception, that's an issue that's been litigated a lot, right? Mm -hmm. And there are some factors that go into it. But, you know, when you get into questions of, you know, what's fair use, it's it's really wiggly. You know, it's really wiggly and you got to be really careful and there's no like straight answer. It's just like, well, if it's, you know, X, Y, and Z, then it's probably fair use. But if there's too much profit being made off of somebody else's stuff, then it may not, you know, it, it's just, it's very wiggly. The whole thing is very wiggly. Well, I remember the first time I originally kind of realized that uh, this whole copyright thing was a bit a wider spread issue than a lot of people talk about in the creative community was uh, several years ago and I think actually a, a couple times since uh, Snapchat got in trouble for because they have filters when you take a selfie or a video or a photo you can you know overlay filters and their team or their developers create these you know weird different things yes. and they have gotten in trouble several times for creating filters that um copy other artists or especially makeup artists because a lot of it's face filters and, uh -huh. and so I think it's interesting that because on one hand you're like well did they actually is there proof that they actually saw that this person this artist 
you know, did this thing? Or was it just happenstance that the creative filter person decided, oh, this looks cool. And then that makeup artist said, hey, I posted this and it looks exactly like my makeup design from, you know, way back when. So how does that work? Uh, you know, like I said, it's all very wiggly, yeah. Yeah. you know, I mean, it's, it's hard to say, like, you know how our minds work, right? So we, and sometimes it's like deja vu, right? Um, so you'll, you'll see something or be in a situation and it seems like you've been there before. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. Even though maybe you weren't there before. But I mean, part of the problem is, is that um, you can hear something and then create something later that sounds a lot like it because you don't remember that you heard it, right? Yeah. For example, there was a copyright claim against, uh, it was George Harrison. So there was this song and it was uh, My Sweet Lord. My sweet Lord, hallelujah. Remember that one? My sweet Lord. Okay, well, he was sued for crop copyright infringement by, um, I think it was the Shirelles, okay? Because they alleged that his chord progression was a lot like their, um, he's so fine, shoo-lang, shoo-lang, shoo-lang. Shoo-lang, shoo-lang, shoo-lang. That, remember that song? Okay, that was a real thing. Sorry about the singing. No, That's you're great. Fine. Podcast, <laughs> podcast peeps, sorry. Um, anyway, I bet you I'm the only guest that has sung on your podcast. So, so far. far. Yeah. And you have some singers, so we might have to shake it. So, so you're adding a wonderful extra dimension. There you go. But anyway, they, they sued him for copyright infringement. I forget what the outcome was. I think they won because they... they um, they alleged that he had copied it and it did sound an awful lot like it, you know, like it was copied and they were able to convince a jury that actually, you know, he copied it. Now, did he really copy it? Well, I don't know. You know, he was a musician. So there's a lot of factors that go into this. Did he have access to it beforehand? Would he have been exposed to it? Well, probably because he was a musician, right? And this song came out during his lifetime. And, you know, he probably would have heard it. And, you know, all this stuff is going to go to the jury. And the jury's going to evaluate all this stuff. And that's how they make a decision. And unfortunately, you know, like, so like with the makeup artist thing, well, would, would the podcast, not the podcast, would the Snapchat peeps who were making the filter, would they have had access to that, um, you know, protected work? Probably. Maybe. I don't know. Would they have seen it? Maybe. I don't know. You know what I'm saying? So it's just but one of those. Probably, they're probably surfing like the internet for ideas to spark, you know, whatever thing so it probably was one of those situations where somebody because as a creative person like we are always on the lookout for creative oh. ideas everything we see we're like oh that's really cool and like you were saying we might forget that we saw something and it triggered that that idea exactly and you know like everybody's got a swipe file don't you have a swipe file yeah. yeah. Okay. For people who don't know, when you're, when you write copy, and I don't mean copyright, when I mean like write sales copy, yeah. you have what's called a swipe file, a swipe file of, you know, other people's ideas or other people's writing that you liked or th you liked the way they laid something out or you liked the way they made a certain point. And just because you use somebody else's like framework doesn't mean that you are copying them if it's in your own words, right? right? So I, mean, I think people also get really hung up on, oh, well, you can't, you can't use that phrase because um, I've been using the phrase. Well, we, we know that phrases can't be copyrighted, okay? These little chunks, like Paris Hilton a few years ago, um, she was trying to assert some kind of ownership over the phrase, that's hot. That's hot. I guess that was her thing. That's hot. Right. And maybe you can register a trademark for that's hot for whatever, you know, for, for that, but you can't copyright that because it's not big enough. It's not creative enough. It's not a work of creative expression. Just going around saying 
that's hot. It's you know, a cool slang that everybody says at some point. Exactly. Exactly. You cannot stop me from saying that's hot. Right. right? <laughs> I'm making stuff up over here. I don't know if that's what she said. I'm just imagining Paris Hilton going around saying that's hot. I mean, you can picture it. It goes with the image. Yeah. Oh, totally. Right. Well, okay, she's so got the dog. She's got the dog and, and the pink whatever. And she's going around saying that's hot. <laughs> so how does something like that connect with uh, Nike's just do it? Can I do oh, okay. All right. So that's a trademark, right? So people get confused about patents and trademarks and copyrights. So let's talk about the difference. The difference. Okay. So what's the, di what's a patent? A patent is a, um, when you have a patent, you have the exclusive right for 20 years from the date of filing to, um, make use or sell a novel, useful and non-obvious invention. Okay. So novel, new, right? Useful, has to be useful, non-obvious, meaning it can't be obvious to the person down the street to put, you know, X and Y and Z together and make X, Y, Z, right? Mm -hmm. So that's a patent. So if it's useful, it's protected by patent law. If it is a creative work reduced to a tangible medium, that is protected by copyright. So copyright protects any work, any creative work reduced to a tangible medium. And it is protected the moment it is reduced to a tangible medium. Now notice that it has to be tangible, okay? You have to be able to experience it with one of your five sen senses. I almost said sentences. <laughs> one of your five senses. If you can't experience it with one of your five sen senses, it is not capable of copyright protection. You don't have to register it in order to have rights to your creative work, okay? You just have to reduce it to a tangible medium. So what are some examples of things that are covered by copyright law? Photographs, poetry, um, you know, novels or any literary work, any art like sculpture or painting. Um, if you arrange lights in an artistic way on on the Eiffel Tower, the arrangement of those lights is, is protected by copyright law. No kidding. If you take a picture of the Eiffel Tower at night when the lights are on, you're violating the creator's copyright. I wish I were joking. I am not. <laughs> uh, what else is covered? I think you think again about taking a picture of the Eiffel Tower at night. <laughs> I know, I know, right? But it's true. Uh, what else is covered? I mean, music is covered. Um, derivative works are also covered. So if you paint a painting and I take a picture of it, I have reproduced the work photographically and I'm guilty of copyright infringement, all right? If somebody paints a mural on a wall and it's, it's public and I take a picture of it and I put it on T-shirts and I sell it, that's copyright infringement, okay? So, you know, if, I, if you write a novel in Spanish and I translate it to English without paying you or getting your permission or licensing that from you, I've done copyright infringement because that is a derivative work, okay? So that's copyright. Anything creative. Trademarks. What's a trademark? A trademark is a source identifier. A trademark oh, exists. You. Angela, let me just interrupt yes. you for a second if I could to clarify on copyrights um, before we get yes. too far into trademark and trademark questions. So um, as a creator, are you automatically protected if you, even if you don't write copyright at the bottom just because you created it? Do you have to actually file with the copyright office, etc.? Those are very good questions. You are automatic. Your work is automatically copyrighted the moment you reduce it to a tangible medium. You don't have to put the circle C on it and you don't have to register it. Right. This is why people inadvertently violate other people's copyrights all the time, right? They think, oh, well, if it doesn't have the circle C on it, then it's not Copywritten. Well, no, no, it's somebody else's work. And if it doesn't have a Creative Commons license on it, then don't copy it. <laughs> um, you know, it might be, you might be able, like, uh, if you go to YouTube, I'm not sorry, not YouTube, scratch that. If you go to Google and you search their images and you go to um, the far right, there's a little drop down menu. And if you're looking at images, you can actually pick 
images that are usable um, under the Creative Commons license, right? And then there are other images that are usable for non-commercial purposes. And then there are other images that are usable for non-commercial purposes if you alter them, right? I mean, there's a whole bunch of different types of rights that people have granted to reuse their work. And you need to make sure that you know what that is. Now, if you want to be super sure that you are not committing copyright infringement, then, you know, go pay for the images at Getty Photos or something like that. Um, what was the other part of your question? Oh, damages. Um, so what do you get when you register it? When you register your work, you have the right to get statutory damages for copyright infringement. You don't have to prove your damages. If you don't have a registration, then you do have to prove your damages. You would have to prove that, um, you know, Joe over here copied your image and, um, you know, you regularly sell your photographs for $5.95 on, uh, you know, whatever website. And because Joe sold a hundred of your photographs, they were on t-shirts, right? He sold t-shirts for $12.95. You're going to allege that for every t-shirt Joe sold, he owes you the value of your, um, you know, your uh, creation that was on it, right? So he owes you a license fee for that. And, you know, if you, if you register your, your copyright, you can also get, um, you know, punitive damages for, um, you know, extraordinary acts of infringement and all of that. So, you know, there's a lot of stuff that you get when you register. It basically means that you don't, there's a whole bunch of stuff you don't have to prove. And proof is expensive when you try to do it, legally speaking. Um, so it's not very expensive to register a copyright. It's like 40 bucks. So, you know, you might just as well do it if you have something that it, that is really valuable to you, you know? But how, so. So how much would you have to register? So let's, let's say that you're an artist, you're, you're a prolific artist, and you, we have mm -hmm. in our community who created just this morning four new works of art. So, you know, like if she wanted, and if she wanted to start selling them on, online or displaying them in museums, wherever, you can't copyright every single one, and yet everyone is unique. So how do you do that? Um, you know, you can copyright some stuff in batches, right? Um, and like things like blogs. I mean, there's some stuff that the copyright law doesn't really contemplate, right? Like try to get a copyright for your blog. <laughs> well, you can only register stuff that's, that you, it's basically like taking a snapshot at a point in time and saying, this is all registered. So you have to like keep registering the new stuff and you can register stuff in batches like say for example that you're a photographer and you create a bunch of photos right you can register stuff in batches because imagine good lord paying forty dollars per photo right. to register it um so i mean there's kind of different ways to register different stuff but you can register it in batches okay like all your blog content is a batch you know someone violates um your work of art and you need to take action. If you have already filed copyright, then you just submit, you probably, there's probably a place to submit that infringement on the copyright side, I'm guessing, correct? Uh, you, you sue them in federal court so, for copyright infringement. So, the, but, the, but the course of action is, you said that they didn't need to prove it. So how do they bring that action against somebody? No, 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 no. What I mean is you are presumed to have certain rights, right? Um, so, when I say you don't have to prove it, it just means that like when you go into court, when I've registered something with the, with the copyright office, I don't have to prove when I created it. Right. Okay. Because I already told you that when I registered the copyright, um, I don't have to prove that I was the creator because I already told you that when I registered the copyright, um, I don't have to prove that this exact thing is my work because I already submitted that when I registered the copyright. Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. So when I say that you don't, there's a whole bunch of stuff you don't have to prove, I mean that you don't have to prove all that. It's already presumed because it's in the record already. Okay. It's in the record that I own this because, you know, that I created it and I created it on this date and, and that I'm the real owner because I already filed the copyright. So I don't have to prove all of that stuff in a court of law. It's presumed. It's already part of the public record. So we can just like skip all that. And, you know, <laughs> go to the juicy stuff, like how much do I get paid because Joe infringed my copyright. 
Does that make sense? Yeah. So, so not only that, but how much does it cost me in federal court to, you know, file the claim of copyright infringement? How long, how long the court process approximately? I know everyone is different. So yeah. just ballpark and uh, like perhaps there's a case you've already done that you could just like kind of give the gen generalities of it because part of the deal too it's like and I, I as business as entrepreneurs and product developers we've been round and around this ourselves since the concept that yeah. okay we could file but then if somebody actually was infringed on our rights or even our trademark then uh -huh. we would have to take them to yeah. court would we be willing to take the time and money necessary to do that so if you could speak to yeah. that well I mean, that's, that's up to you and it depends on what lawyer you hire. I mean, everybody bills differently and you know, you're, you're going to have to take them to federal court and that's not cheap. Um, usually you send them a demand letter first and say, listen, um, you know, you can either pay me this or I'm going to go into court and I'm going to ask for that and then more and then more and then more. And I'm going to ask that you pay my attorney's fees, you know, and here's my copyright. Here's the registration. Here's the number. And, you know, it makes them take their feet off the table. Yeah. And, you know, usually you'll get a call from their attorney going, let's talk. Yeah. <laughs> let's settle this, yeah. you know, because they don't want to go to court. Right. God, why would you? You know, when I've already laid, laid it out for you, you right. know, and I've negotiated on the client side. Um, those sorts of cases and you know I've, I've been able to negotiate with opposing counsel um, one of the cases that I remember most vividly was a guy he owned a business and one of his employees um, for the company Christmas party not kidding took a very nice photograph of snowy Lake Tahoe off of the internet <laughs> It didn't have the circle C on it in her defense, but she should have known better anyway. She didn't <laughs> know any better. And um, I think the demand was for $20,000. And I ended up settling the case for my client for about two. <laughs> um, because I basically said to opposing counsel, look, um, this was my, my client's bonehead employee. She really didn't know. And it was for the company. Uh, Christmas party <laughs> okay yeah. the invitation it wasn't for commercial purposes and they were like yeah fine okay so we settled for a couple thousand dollars but you know it cost them a couple thousand dollars to resolve right. it right wow so. okay. yeah there, it's so there's so many ins and outs and I want to we're so glad we have people like you yeah, who just... know the ins and outs <laughs> because learning all that for a creative <laughs> is just sort of like you start learning it and you get down that rabbit hole and at first you're like this is so so interesting and then you're like this there's so many scenarios and so many ways to go that I could live yeah. spend my entire life and never make another painting because I'm still learning on about. how to protect myself it's yeah it's crazy and you know people people think that that this area of the law is you know easy it's like oh you just you just apply you just file a trademark application it's like yeah filing the application is the easy part okay yeah. you know yeah. uh, so there's so a whole bunch of analysis that happens before that. Yeah. So you mentioned trademark. So now I stopped you earlier in continuing yes. with the explanation on the trademark and the distinctions and such. So pick up. Yes. That. So a trademark is a source identifier, right? So for example, um, if I see this, can you see it? The Xbox. Um, yeah. Okay. It's 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 the wrong way. It's is. Can you read it or is it a yeah, mirror image? This is Yeah. Is it backward? No. No, it's not. It's good. Oh, it's not backward. Okay, no, that's no. cool. Anyway, when I see Kleenex, I know that, you know, this this uh, box of tissues was made by, uh, is it Procter & Gamble that owns Kleenex? I, I think, think so, so, yeah. Something like I'm that. not sure. Anyway, whoever owns Kleenex made these, right? When I, when I see, I'm um, trying to find something with a brand on it, I don't have anything. <laughs> When I see the night, the swoosh, I know that the swoosh, and I know that was made by Nike, right? right. So um, for me, oh, Nike shoes, um, yeah, yeah, like that Yeti blue, right? Like I know that is a blue brand microphone, and Yeti is one of their models. I'm sure that they have a trademark for that, but um, I know that that 
microphone is going to work really well for me because other people have used it, right? Mm -hmm. um, when I buy a Nike shoe, when I see that shoe, I go to myself, mm -mm. no, I know if I buy that shoe, I know their heel counters are really wide and I'm going to be fighting that the whole time I wear it. So I'm going to buy the three stripe. Oh, that was four. Sorry. I'm going to buy the three stripe shoe instead, right? <laughs> I'm going to buy the Adidas shoe because I know that Adidas shoes have certain characteristics because of the way Adidas makes their shoes. So the brand, the trademark is just a source identifier. It tells me where that product or service came from, right? So I know there are certain things that I get when I buy something that has that mark on it. Like when I know, when I see the blue box and it's small, what am I getting? The, Anyone? The blue box on the mic, you mean? No, no. If I'm getting something small in a blue box yeah. and a white ribbon, what is it? White ribbon, small blue box. Oh, oh. gosh. Um, you gotta tell us when a small blue box, blue, white, what blue box? Robin's egg blue box, small, with Tiffany. a white ribbon. Oh. Tiffany's. Right? Thank you. There you go. So do you see how powerful? I've never these, gotten Tiffany's. <laughs> there you go. You see how the how powerful these brand identifiers are. Yeah. Tiffany blue with a white ribbon. I know I'm getting a really great piece of jewelry that says Tiffany on it, right? Yeah. <laughs> So yeah, so well, brands are you said Robin Blue because I was thinking because I'm online so much I was thinking Dropbox. <laughs> no, 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 not that blue. The Robin's Egg Blue. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So and a trademark can be anything. It can be um, a shape like the shape shape of a Coca Cola bottle that is registered as a trademark, right? Um, it can be a color like John Deere has the color green registered for tractors. Wow. Uh, it can be, oh, Owens Corning pink fiberglass insulation. The pink, that is a registered trademark of Owens Corning. Nobody else can make pink insulation, right? Oh, wow. You know those big green eggs, those big green egg barbecues? Big green egg actually has a registered trademark for the color green for barbecues, nobody else can make a blue, I'm sorry, a green ceramic barbecue. You gotta make it some other color. You can make it blue, you can make it yellow, you can make it pink, <laughs> but you can't make it green because that's a registered trademark owned by Big Green Egg. You can make a slogan a trademark, you know, like L'Oreal's just do it. I'm sorry, you're worth it. <laughs> uh, Nike's just do it, I'm getting them all mixed up. Um, what else is a great slogan? Uh, what else? Um, Help me out. Yeah, I'm kind of um, FedEx. Let's see, FedEx and you. you oh, the world on time. The world on time. Yeah. The world on time. Fed, that's a, a registered trademark of Federal Express. Um, Friendly skies. It, it can be a logo, right? Like think about the Tony the Tiger logo. That is a registered trademark of Kellogg Foods. Uh, what else? Well, the Nat Geo, the just square rectangle of the Nat Geograph National Geographic. Um, so. Yep. You can register that as a trademark too. Like this logo on my blue Yeti, like look at your microphone. Do you yeah. see that, that circle? It says blue. I'm sure that they have that registered. Yep. You're watching as, the video. I'm holding it up guys. Yep. I'm sure that's registered as a trademark. Now, Angela, if it is, my understanding is that let's, okay. So back to the blue box, the blue Tiffany box that you mentioned. Yep. No one could do that blue box in the industries that Tiffany sells in. But well, let's assume, let's assume that it's registered. I don't know that it is or not. Right. I, the point that I was making is that people associate these source identifiers sure. very readily. Sure. Right? Let's, but let's say that that was trademarked to Tiffany. Yes. Now, okay. somebody could, you know, let's say a paper company could ostensibly ship their paper and, a, and an identical blue box, just maybe the different size to the paper, they could actually trademark it for that different category of industry, correct? Um, okay. So Tiffany is for your question is, is kind of a bad example because it's a famous mark, right? So anytime you have a famous mark and somebody else, um, somebody else uses that famous mark for other things, um, the brand owner, the trademark owner will allege that your use even though it's not in competing goods necessarily, it dilutes their mark, okay? 
So there's this thing for famous brands called dilution. Um, and that means basically that you are taking their, you've adopted the Tiffany blue only because it's so famous, right? And now you're applying it to your goods and it's diluting the value of their famous mark. So let's use another, let's use another mark that's not that famous. Okay, let's say, let's say that you have a mark, abracadabra, I'm just making this up. Okay, let's say you have a mark called abracadabra for video production right? You have a video production studio and you, you have franchises in a couple of different states and it's abracadabra circle R video production. And then somebody else wants to come out with a cleaning product that just cleans everything. I mean, it cleans everything. It's like magic, man. And they want to call it abracadabra. Infringing? No. No completely different goods, completely different services, not complimentary at all, right? Like you would never, you would never use abracadabra uh, cleaning solution, cleaning solvent, whatever you want to call it with video. It's, 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 it's two totally different things. This is why, for example, we can have United Airlines, right? Which sells uh, passenger service on airlines and United van lines, which moves household goods all yeah. around the country, right? So that's why those two marks can exist, can coexist, because the consumer who looks at those isn't going to say, gee, hmm, I wonder if the same people who are providing this airline service are also providing this moving your household goods service, hmm, yeah. right? Right. But if you're used to seeing the Tiffany blue box, right? You might go, huh? Okay. Well, Tiffany produces jewelry. They produce handbags. They do. They produce uh, stationery, right? They produce writing instruments like pens. They must've gotten into copy paper. They must've gotten into office supplies and I didn't even know it. <laughs> right. Ooh, Tiffany blue. But do you see what I mean? Right. Right. No, it's yeah. like using the Nike swoop for um, uh, a furniture. It's right? Just, like, it's, it's too obvious that that's obviously a brand and logo and trademark specific, specifically for Nike. And so anybody seeing it on anything besides the Nike company is just going to be like, you're a cop. Why? Yeah. You're really right. shooting yourself in the foot. <laughs> well, Yes. <laughs> Har har. <laughs> I'm sure you didn't mean that to, to be uh, ironic, but it is. Yeah. So, yeah. So anytime you have a famous mark, gosh, just stay away from it. Right. Don't, don't go, don't go using, um, famous, famous marks or anything that even approaches the famous mark. Cause I can guarantee you, you're going to get a letter. You're going to get a letter <laughs> from a really big law firm, right. Or from Nike's corporate council. And they're going to say, Tisk tisk. Yeah. No, 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 no. Cease and desist immediately, right? You know what? Because that reminds me. I remember back when I start. I do. I do freelance um, marketing for smaller businesses, and I remember hearing about how if a YouTube person had a logo shirt on, and I I remember specifically Coca Cola went after this, but people wearing like Coca Cola shirts in whatever random video they were creating is like they just happened to have a Coca Cola shirt on. Um, and it was totally unrelated to whatever they were talking about. It was just, they're creating video. They have it on. Um, they were like requiring people to blur out the Coca-Cola logo in their marketing. Do, is that under any of the copyright law stuff you do? Or is that just um, brand, some different form of legal infringement, infringement or anything? And this um, is like okay. okay. So... So with famous marks, famous marks, when you've got a famous mark, um, you, you really are vigilant about protecting your brand image, right? Like say, for example, the guy was wearing a Coca-Cola shirt and he was doing a video that was like saying really deprecative things about women, right? Like super misogynistic stuff. If I were Coca-Cola, I do not want my brand associated with that, right? 
And I would write him and tell him, you know, either take it down or blur out our name because we do not want to be associated with that. Like, uh, uh-uh, just forget it. Right. Mm-hmm. Same deal. If, you know, someone is, um, you know, saying racist stuff, right? Like you don't want your brand associated with that. You know, someone's wearing a Louis Vuitton, um, you know, whatever, uh, does Louis Vuitton make jewelry? Anyway, <laughs> Gucci, right? You're wearing this, this beautiful Gucci and it's got the logo all over it and it's prominently displayed and you're spewing a bunch of, you know, nasty stuff that's, you know, racist or misogynist. No one's going to want, want their brand associated with that, right? And so, yeah, they would be completely within their rights. It's called tarnishment, right? Where you are doing things that are tarnishing my brand. You are making me look bad. I have this very famous brand and I have really worked hard to build consumer goodwill. And here you are with your naughty mouth and your filthy mind and you're making me look bad. Yeah. Mm. You know, they are totally within their rights. Yes, absolutely. So this is so wow. interesting and we're already longer than we said we would keep you. Do you have a little, bit <laughs> do you have a little more time? Yeah. Yeah, I do. Okay. This is fun. So it's good. It's okay. It's okay. I like it. Fun for us. Very interesting. I can only imagine. It seems to me that the demand for you and your services in this industry in this day and age is just as would have just escalated because there, and you would have worked really have to be working really hard to keep up because law doesn't like the doesn't like all the gray areas and there are so many with this. Law prefers the black mm-hmm. and white, right? And this <laughs> and there's not a whole lot of black and white in this. So I can only imagine how it's changed and how you're having to constantly keep up with it, kind of like a CPA having to keep up with tax law. But one of mm-hmm. so along those lines, the leading question to that is domain names. Um, oh <laughs> whether or not, right, right, whether or not they serve just the fact of having a domain name. So you have a website, you have a domain name and then you, but you haven't copyrighted, you haven't trademarked it rather. It's automatically copyrighted by having it. Um, Does that protect you having it without trademarking it? So what are the ins and outs of, because I know that there's a lot of thought these days that it's not as important to trademark things when it's so obvious that, that that it belongs to you, that it's there, that it's like, that it's alive and well, you know, that you've been building it all along. I'm, I'm sorry, the, the end of that broke up a little bit. Okay, sorry, so, so the question is, let's say that, so if you have a website and you have a certain domain name, it's a great domain name and you haven't trademarked it um, because it's obviously your site, you own the domain name, you're running it as a site, as your blog, whatever. So then like, do you still need to trademark it? Because you have some copyright protection by virtue of it uh, ad- addressing the five cents law of copywriting, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so then what else, you know, what can you tell us about that? Okay, so um, there, there are some issues where, there are a lot of intellectual property issues that bleed into one another, right? So you talked about copyright. So you can, you can copyright the content, you can register the content of your blog, right, or your website, but it's already protected by copyright, right? So as soon as you put it up, it's protected. Let's talk about the whole domain name thing. So trademarks are goods specific, right? So we already talked about how we can have two, um, we can have two Uniteds existing. We can have United Van Lines and we can have United Airlines, right? All right, so let's say that you have a blog and your blog is, uh, we'll make stuff up, we'll use Abracadabra. My blog is abracadabra.com and I talk about magic, (laughs) right? I write a blog about magic. I have all these videos about my magic tricks, right? All that content is already, protected by copyright. Do I own the trademark for Abracadabra for my blog? Um, Arguably, yes, I have common law trademark rights, okay? For a blog about magic. If somebody else wants to get abracadabra.net and they want to put up crazy cat videos, right? (laughs) They could actually get a trademark registration for a blog about crazy cat videos, right? About pet videos, um, a blog about pets. It's abracadabra.com and it's about my cat, 
right? It's about my cat and all the funny things that my cat does all day. And um, that's my blog. <laughs> okay. Though those are arguably two very different things. They're both blogs, right? But, but the way, the, the way that the trademark goods and services are registered is that, um, so your blog is probably going to be under, I think it's international class 41 or 43. I don't quite remember. Um, but we have goods divided into international classes, right? So just because you have rights under class 41 doesn't necessarily give you rights to everything in that class if the goods are really different, right? So if you run a blog about magic and I run a blog about cats, um, you wouldn't necessarily see, so part of the inquiry about confusingly similar, right? Because that's always the inquiry. Would the average consumer be confused if confronted by the same two items and think that they came from the same source? Well, in this case, people who do magic blogs probably are not over here doing cat blogs, right? right? So that's kind of the calculus that you have to go through. The other issue, too, is is use of a domain name without more use under the trademark law, okay? Because use under the trademark law is not what we think about as use, okay? Mm. So we can go down this rabbit hole. So use is applied to goods and services that are for sale or advertised for sale in commerce, okay, in interstate, okay? So it has to be interstate commerce. It can't be just in your state. It's just in your state. No go, okay? It has to be applied to the goods or services, right? So in this case, you would actually have to register. Let's say, for example, that you had, uh, I, I'm abracadabra.com and I have a magic blog, right? And I have a trademark registration for a, um, a, a little kit that I sell on Amazon and it has magic stuff in it, right? It has magic, like magic props in it, right? The little thing, the little handkerchief that you, you know, the coins, whatever, right? The bunny that comes out of the hat, all that. So I have that on Amazon.com and I sell that. And then I also have all kinds of instructional videos on how to use everything um, on my abracadabra.com website. Am I using, so I registered abracadabra for my magic props, right? For, um, you know, toys probably under, or I don't know what toys are. I think it depends on the toy. But anyway, toys under class nine. I'm making stuff up over here. Um, and, but am I, is my use of abracadabra.com on my website use for the goods that I have the registered trademark for? No, it's not use. Because in order to have use, I have to use the trademark on the goods for which I have the registration. I don't get the right to prevent anybody else from using abracadabra on other stuff, right? That's not related. It has to be something that would be confusingly similar. A lot of trademark registrants are under the assumption that because they have a trademark registration for X, they can prevent other people from using it on Y. And that's not always true. It depends. You have to look at the goods, you know? So there's a lot of stuff that goes into this that I don't think people really appreciate. Um, anyway, well, that's all. <laughs> to support that like people can go on legalzoom.com and fi file their own however yes they can um, and, and they can go directly to the USPTO and file file it themselves mm -hmm. however yes, they can. It's because it is very confusing if they want to make sure that they're actually all that effort and money that they're still going to expend is actually going to be protecting them they definitely should consult with professional directly would you is that like your experience I mean I know you're gonna be biased toward you know go for the lawyer thing but and I'm, I'm, I'm guessing that you have stories of people that you've had to help who went that route and then discovered they weren't protected yep I have tons of stories like that yeah and you know it's funny yes you can go file your own registration okay but the, the thing is 
you need to do a good search first. If you don't do a search and analyze the search, you could be filing an application that will never issue, right? Because it will never issue because there's this other mark out here that you didn't know about that was confusingly similar. Um, maybe you saw it and you thought that it wouldn't, your mark wouldn't infringe this registered mark because your mark is not exactly similar. That is not part of the calculus. It doesn't have to be exactly similar. Maybe you saw the mark and you thought, well, it's not exactly similar and the goods aren't exactly the same. So it won't infringe. That also is not part of the calculus, okay? So people don't understand where the line is and how close they can get to other people's marks. And I do, because I've been doing this for, you know, 10 years. I under, more than that, good Lord. Okay, I won't say. Uh, <laughs> long time, right? More than 10 years. Um, so I know where the line is and I know how close we can get to it. And I actually do a lot of counseling with my clients too. So when you pay me to, you know, work with you on your trademark registration, I'm not just saying, okay, great, thanks. I'll go file this now. You right. know, right. I actually go in and I look at the record, but before that I talk to you, I want to find out how are you using the mark? What are your, what are, what's the future for this mark? Where do you see this going? You know, let's think into the future. What else do we need to think about here? Um, are you using it properly? How can I help you improve your use? Because a lot of people are using their marks, but they're using them the wrong way. Um, or they're using them, they think they're using them, but we already talked about use, right? And it doesn't mean what we think it means. It means what it, how it's defined in the, um, the trademark law, the Lanham Act, right? So there's all this stuff that goes into it. And I bring, the value that I bring to the table is not, you know, being the ministerial person that files the trademark application. The value that I bring to the table is the advice and the counseling that I give to my clients to help them figure out, you know, where is this going in the future? Um, and how are we using it now? And what should we be filing now? Right? Because there's a lot of stuff that goes on kind of behind the scenes that they don't know about because they've never filed a trademark application before. And I can help them not step in it. Right? They, sometimes I, you know, my clients come to me and they hand me what I like to call the steaming pile. Right? And they say, Angela, will you please register this for me? I tried to register it and um, I got refused. Right? And then I'll go in and I'll look at the record. And sometimes they have so they have made so many admissions to the trademark examiner and I can't help them anymore because anytime we go and refile it, the trademark examiner who gets the new application is going to go look at the record and they're going to see that filing there. Right. <laughs> and they're going to say, wait a minute, wait a minute. Okay. So this one was refused. Same goods, same client. Oh, now they've got an attorney. Huh? Well, let's go see what they filed before, you know, and they've made a bunch of admissions. That are not good, right? And and I anyway. Yeah. <laughs> people get themselves into all kinds of trouble, and you don't get your filing feedback, right? There's no do-overs. So you file it, you don't get your filing feedback. So you could stand on the front porch and light hundred dollar bills on fire if you want to. I don't recommend that. Right. I recommend that you get some help. You know, if your brand matters, if your business matters, um, then you know, get some legal advice. So, so that makes a lot of sense just with the, okay, so the concept is if you have a domain name that is a certain name and you go to create a product with that domain name, does, you still would recommend the trademarking of the product brand name because that's an actual tangible product. Is that correct? Uh, only if you don't want other people using it. If you don't care, if you don't care then don't register it. You may have to rebrand later, you know, or you may have to uh, uh, oppose somebody else's trademark later if they're trying to register it. That's a, that's really expensive, right? Mm -hmm. An opposition. Yeah. Oh, an opposition is probably easily triple what it costs to register the trademark. So, you know, if you want to save money, but spend more later, you can do that. It's yeah. all right. Or pre that. prevention is definitely better if yeah. you can do it. Oh, God, yeah. Prevention is so much better than, um, you know, trying to cure the problem later. I worked with a client earlier this year. Actually, no, it was last year. 
um, who didn't bother to register his trademark and the naughty infringer actually stole his brand, applied for the registration. And um, my client ended up having to give up his brand because he just couldn't afford to fight the guy. Wow. He was mad. He was yeah. so mad. I was like, well, you know, there's nothing I can do about this. We can fight him or, you know, you can, you can maybe settle with him and get him to get, you know, get him to pay you a little bit and you can go rebrand. Well, and that's what he eventually ended up doing because it was just too expensive to fight this guy. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, it's actually a lot less expensive to just, you know, get some advice and, and register it. Um, but a lot of people don't want to go that route. Right. And that's when I make the real money. <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. So what would people be looking at cost-wise to do the trademark? And again, I know it depends, you know, yeah. on name and how many different industries you have to check and all of that. So yeah. like saying how much to build a house, obviously it depends on what kind of house. So what would be like the, the median range? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so it's less than $2,000 to get a trademark registration. Okay. So I, I don't, I really don't understand why people don't do it. I just, I don't get it, <laughs> okay. Okay. you know? Yeah. So. All right. Well, that's a tremendous help. I'm sure to many people. And we want to shift gears back to the conversation we were having when we first started, because mm -hmm. this will help you and our audience as well. Mm -hmm. You were talking, oh, wow. Look at that mug. That is amazing. <laughs> I know. I call it my big ass mug. It's yeah. about as big as my head. Do you see this? <laughs> yeah. It's yeah. about as big as my head. And it says, behold, I make all things new. <laughs> <laughs> God is a creator. <laughs> <laughs> right. Fantastic. I like that. Um, so we were talking about like you were making videos, Facebook videos, video live, Facebook live videos regularly, I think. And we were talking, you were thinking that yeah. maybe this didn't, um, maybe they were too short because they tend to be on average five minutes and maybe too short for the podcast. Um, uh -huh. And encourage you to know yeah. that you know, package them onto a podcast platform as well as YouTube because there, it gives all people who might want to find you and might need to know what you have to offer an opportunity to find you in the platforms that they most enjoy or they most habituate. Um, so an example of that would be um, like you take the video from Facebook that you've created and you can repackage that and put it on a podcast platform. So that's, that's definitely doable. Now, would you use your same um, website name for that? Would you, I mean, I think that would make sense, right? To name your podcast the same as your website. Did you hear that question? Well, yeah, yeah, I did. Would I make my podcast the same as my website? Um, maybe, but it would depend on what other, what other stuff I was doing, right? So, um, if, so my website is trademarkdoctor.net, even though it has stuff about copyrights and patents on it too. Um, and, and the reason why, I don't know, people don't know what intellectual property is and people don't know what the difference between a patent and a trademark and a copyright is anyway. Right. So I figure that trademark, calling it trademarkdoctor.net doesn't really make any difference if I'm yeah, talking about copyright and patents, right? Yeah, um, otherwise. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I don't know. I mean, maybe I should rebrand. I don't know. People rebrand all the time, but what would I call it? I mean, yeah, I guess I could call it the trademark doctor podcast or, you know, IP daily. Ha ha ha. Get it? IP. Yeah, I know. I know. I know. I'm very cheeky. I'm very cheeky. So yeah, I, I could just see myself. Save on I can see yeah. myself doing so, it. And we don't, this isn't going to air right away. So, you know, we don't want you to give away any, all the thoughts that you might come up with because right. you may not have grabbed those names for yourself before. And guys, this is a terrible <laughs> idea to steal an idea from somebody who's in the copyright <laughs> business. Yeah. Right. Business. So, so that, but that would be, let's say that you did name it the trademark doctor.net. Um, um, would you, so would that, copyright would that trademark help would that extend your podcast i would imagine so right you own that trademark or have i yeah. missed a lesson today <laughs> no 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 you're fine um yeah i mean maybe i would just call it ip daily or um i, I don't know ip daily we all have to right <laughs> <Yeah>. right <laughs> <laughs> Hey, hey, we very like, cheeky very cheeky yeah, very cheeky we definitely like the daily name so that would be yeah. great 
uh, one of the things we were talking about earlier, we said, well, no, we need to stop, you know, and well, she wears yoga pants and Uggs. So yeah. Because yeah. Business as usual. Okay. Okay. So, so that I'm glad you, so, so here's the thing. Um, you were talk, starting out saying that, you know, for being an attorney and representing law, you know, in your videos, et cetera, as well as yourself to your brand, you know, you, like people think that an attorney should be a certain way. And so you were taught, so we were joking before we started recording guys about, you know, what we're wearing on the lower half. And so for us, right. it to be, you know, like shorts or skirts or whatever, and you've got yoga pants and Uggs, we've got Tevas, yeah. Tevas, whatever. And, um, and so that's one of the wonder, the freedom, you know, of being the entrepreneur and being able to do that. And absolutely, I think you should, as an attorney, represent yourself as you are, wherever you are, and not worry about the stuff, the, um, the corporate look, because yeah. like we were saying earlier, everybody's used to that and everybody expects that corporate look and what's going to make them look twice. If it's something dry and legal, they think they might not want to tune into is if you're different. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think, I think, um, you know, they, they say authenticity is the new currency. <laughs> yeah. um, I have a pretty big personality and if people don't like it, I'm totally okay with that. Right. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm going to show up like this, you know, business on the top party on the bottom, <laughs> you know, but this is, this is how I work. I work at home. Um, I, you know, I like being able to go to the gym midday if I want to, or go for a run or, you know, do whatever I want to do. And that's why I have the, the life that I have. And um, you know, I, I like creating content for people and I like to just show up how I am. Yeah. So, no, um, you know, I, I do most of the time do hair and makeup before I show up. Um, I have shown up, I think I've shown up once without it. Um, I don't really care, but anyway, uh, but because, you know, video is permanent, we, we yeah. <laughs> yeah. you know, yeah. We like to at least do a little something with the hair before we show up. Yeah. Um, but, you know, for me, it's just important to show up as myself because I'm trying to attract a certain kind of client, right? Mm -hmm. Like I don't want clients who are like uptight and want the corporate person because I'm not the corporate person and I'll never be the corporate person. And so if they want the corporate person, then they need to go hire somebody else. Yeah. Um, because that's not me. Yeah. So, so sorry, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. So somebody tried, this one guy tried to tell me once, um, I think I said something deprecative about, um, cereal and eating grains, right? Uh, I don't eat grains and I think processed food is crap. And I think I said something like that processed food is crap, mm -hmm. um, on one of my videos once because I was using, I think I was using Kellogg's as, some um, uh, an example for something, but I wanted to make it really clear that I don't eat processed food because I think processed food is crap. Do you want me to say it again? Processed food is crap. <laughs> and this guy actually commented on my video and he was like, well, Angela, I don't think that you should say processed food is crap. Actually, he didn't comment on my video. He actually sent me a message, a, a private message. And he said, I don't think you should say processed food is crap because what if, what if, the CEO of Kellogg's was listening and he was tempted to hire you. But then he heard you say that processed food is crap. And I was like, are you serious? Do you really think that's going to happen? Okay. So number one, it's not going to happen, right? This is some guy who like lives in his fear and sits behind a desk all day. You can tell. Um, it's like grow some balls, buddy, right? Grow some balls. Um, <laughs> can't believe I'm saying this on the, on the radio, but this is how I roll. And, and then I was like, listen, if the CEO of Kellogg Foods isn't going to hire me because I think processed food is crap, that is okay with me because processed food is crap, right? Um, and I'm not going to censor myself. I am not going to censor myself and I'm not going to be less than who I am or different than who I am um, because, because I think it sells or because yeah. I'm afraid to say what I think, right? It's like, well, this is me. And if you don't want to hire me, I am totally okay with that. You can go hire the stuffy processed food eating lawyer who wears a suit and a tie, you know, if you want, right. um, that's fine with me. No, that's excellent because it really is about building rapport with the people that you want to work with and whom you yeah. know will want to work with you. So it makes yeah. the most sense to be who you are and toward that, you know, and toward your creating your own videos, 
I'm, you know, like you like to cook Italian food and Spanish food and, and like you said, do yoga or run or whatever. I totally see you creating video snippets. I mean, you're talking about five minute video clips. Mm -hmm. I'm sure that your mind tends to work probably like ours does. And that is like when you're out doing things, when you're, whether it's cooking or running or whatever, is when you come up with a lot more ideas. So rather than making a note of it and oh. waiting until you get back to the computer to do, to, you know, to then clean up, just go ahead in that moment. Like now I'm in the kitchen, we're cooking Spanish food and I just saw the label on this vinegar and it brought to mind this case, etc. Now you've got a clip and it's in a setting that people will stop and watch and it helps them get to know you mm -hmm. as well. That's an awesome idea. Cause you know what I do? So I was out running, right? So I get, I get, I get, um, ideas for content all the time. And I'm trying to find this on my phone because I want to show it to you. I was at, I was running and I saw a sign for a company called Mosquito Joe. And I don't know where you live, but here in Dallas, Texas, we have an awful problem with mosquitoes. And so people pay to have their mosquito, their yard treated so that you don't get eaten every time you step outside, right? In the summertime. So I took a picture of this sign that said Mosquito Joe and it had the word mark and the logo mark and the um and a slogan on it right and i just thought that was the best thing ever and here it is here's the photo that i took i'm going to show it to you here it comes up um i'm gonna move this so that you can see it um oops my phone is acting crazy anyway it said um in the um we'll put it in the show notes you can send us a yeah. Yes, we'll put it in the show notes. I mean, right now I'm just trying to get my, my stupid uh, phone to respond. But anyway, I really wanted people to see this because I thought it was cool. Right. It's, it's not, um, anyway, here it is. I don't know if you can actually see it. Oops. Um, yeah. Yeah. It says make outside fun again. No, I don't know yeah. if they try to do that as a trademark, but I was like, okay, that's kind of cool. Mosquito Joe outside is fun again right? And then um, their Mosquito Joe logo. So I thought that was a really great example. And what's another example that I just saw? So I was just in Costco yesterday and I decided that, um, okay, this is going to make a really good video. It's called, this is, <laughs> this is a photograph that I took, Pool Pets, right? Yeah. So I was going to do a video about why you can't use um, why you can't use words that, that are spelled differently but sound the same as somebody else's trademark, right? So you can't do that. Um, and I'm going to do probably today's video about just that, that subject. So I get ideas for the, these things all the time, right? Like, like the big green egg. You know, I did a case study. People love these case studies, okay? So there's two things that people love. People love trademark wars, okay? They love trademark wars. I call them trademark wars. It's like, you know, Kylie Minogue versus Kylie Jenner, right? They were fighting over the name Kylie, right? So that was trademark wars. That was good for two videos. And they also love case studies. So when I was in Costco, I get my best ideas at Costco. Uh, <laughs> well, I was in Costco and I saw a big blue egg. And I thought to myself, huh, that's interesting. I wonder if big green egg has registered a trademark for the color green for barbecues. And I went and I looked and sure enough, they had, they had, right? So, so that was a video and it was fun and people love them. So yeah, yeah, exactly. And you do it in the context then when you're doing your Facebook, whether it's your Facebook live or you just do the video record and then later put it on your podcast mm -hmm. or on YouTube, whatever, you can still then share that video to Facebook. Uh, people are more likely to turn to click on and listen to what you're saying yeah. if there's a different kind of background. You know, it's like, where is she? She's on location. I want to know where she is and what she's doing. Mm -hmm. So they're much more likely to click, yeah. especially yeah. than if it's just a plain white, white background. So yeah. this is my background. It's yeah. hiding my very messy bookshelf behind, right? Yeah, no, we get it. So it's like, but, but consider making it, I mean, don't worry about hiding those things and just start getting into the rhythm of being real with it and, and being okay with whatever is in the background. You can always start with, I have a messy bookshelf because I actually read my books. Yeah. I don't act like I read books. <laughs> I love it. That's great. <laughs> yeah. Because how many of us have like that perfectly neat bookshelf and we're like, we it don't doesn't. touch those books. It doesn't look like that. But yeah. it's a nice bookshelf, right? Right. 
right? Yeah. No, but I think that's a great idea. So I'm going to start doing Facebook lives whenever I'm out and about. And I can say, you know, here's, here's the big green egg barbecue that I'm talking about folks. So I just want to tell you that tomorrow's video is going to be about yeah. uh, big green egg. And I'm going to check and I'm going to see if they have green registered for their trademark for barbecues. So tune yeah. in tomorrow, you know, to my live and, and I'll talk about that. Exactly. And then that can be purposed into an article on your blog that links to all those other things. So um, yeah, yeah, that links to all those other things. I guess they probably need to get a plug-in to link to like Twitter and all of that. Well, uh, well oh, it's pretty easy. You can yeah. just download a social share plug-in. Um, there's a million. Yeah. Of, um, I think like Shareaholic or Buzz. Oh, Shareaholic. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I've yeah. seen that before. Yeah. Shareaholic. Yeah. And the other, but the other part of it is like, so, so in the article, then you'll, you'll link to your, oh, is that what you're talking about? She'll link to her YouTube. She'll link mm -hmm. to the podcast, yeah. et cetera. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. It's easy. yeah. It's right there. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's really a good idea. So I can link, maybe I should just put that, hmm, thinking about this. I could just put that into uh, the template for the blog articles, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, like here's my podcast, here's my YouTube channel. That's a brilliant idea. Yeah, I should definitely be linking out. I'm taking notes. I'm learning so much. Thank you so much. <laughs> we are so grateful for all that you share with us because we've learned a ton and we've already kept you a lot longer than we promised. And so maybe we can um, just bring this to a close. We, I, we, we had other ideas for you as well. And my mind just went oh. blank for some reason. It happens, you know, not uncommon for it to happen at the wrong inopportune times, but it'll come back. So if it doesn't come back before we end this session together, then we'll send it and follow up to you in email by email. Awesome. Meanwhile, if you could share, um, like what are your dreams for your business? Like what are you looking forward to in growing your business in the future? Um, well, one of the things I'm really excited about right now is coaching other attorneys. Um, so I have a really great law practice that makes me really happy. And, you know, there's a reason why attorneys have such high rates of suicide and alcoholism and drug abuse. Wow. I didn't even oh, it's terrible. It's terrible. I mean, being an attorney should be like a health hazard. It is a health hazard. Um, <laughs> and I'm really, um, I would say lucky, but lucky isn't the right word because I've really designed my practice so that I love it. Right. And one of the things I'm, I'm doing, I'm, I'm actually setting up the program right now is to help attorneys monetize their practices so that they can earn passive income instead of just meeting with clients all day and, and earning money that way, because it can be really hard. Most attorneys don't make very much money. That's kind of the dirty little secret in the profession. The attorneys that work at these big white shoe stuffy law firms, yeah, they make a lot of money, but your average solo or small firm attorney is pretty lucky to make a hundred thousand dollars a year. It's shocking. Yeah. Especially after, you know, investing all that money in a legal education and, and the stress that we deal with on a day to day basis. Right. So long hours. Um, Incredibly long hours as well. Yeah, not not just the long hours. It's we see people at their worst. I mean, I'm lucky because I don't really see people at their worst. I don't have a criminal law or family law, um, uh, you know, practice. But I mean, a lot of attorneys deal with a lot of very stressful um, situations and very stressed out clients, you know, who are dealing with like the most stress they've ever gone through ever. Like when you're going through a divorce pretty stressful. <laughs> you know, you've been accused of a crime, pretty stressful. Right. So, um, so yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to coaching attorneys to, so that they can have their ideal practice too, because I, I think mine's pretty awesome. <laughs> okay. So in that case, then some of the ideas for your video creation would be different. You, uh -huh. So see, so as you're starting to create ideas, the ones that we talked about is more for clients and attracting clients. Yeah there will be a whole other kind of uh, genre or category of videos that, and content that you'll need to create for attracting your attorney mm -hmm. clients that you can coach in future. So we'll put our heads together on that and send you some ideas. And you oh my gosh, it'd be awesome. Yeah. Begin keeping, keeping rather a list of like the two different, cause now you're going to be focusing on two different niches and you know, it's, it's definitely yeah. doable even with your existing content because they can see that and you can leverage that, but you'll definitely yeah. want to create content specifically for the people you want to attract, um, to coach, to yeah. help. 
and that's a very worthy endeavor. It's we've been hearing about a lot of entrepreneurs who are also uh, committing suicide when it is that they realize that you know that what it is that their life is and what it's become is not what, is what not, was sold. Is not well, not just what was sold, but it's what, it's not what they pre- presented to their friends mm-hmm. from peer pressure that they've got to keep up a certain amount of appearances. So that's one category. Another category are those who have made a lot of wealth from like perhaps less than ethical online kind of marketing schemes kind of thing. And they feel empty from it, you know, so it's like a whole, you know, people do that. You mean people do that? I'm shocked. I'm shocked. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I hear you. It's been a lot of fun. So we will keep in touch and um, looking forward to following up with you on your next chapter as well. And thank you so much for sharing all your advice and wisdom and going down those rabbit holes and making it entertaining it was yeah <laughs> all these subjects can be can sometimes be like so dry and you're like oh my gosh we're talking about legal stuff but it was really entertaining and yeah. you're a funny awesome person yeah and oh uh, thank you I'm, I'm glad that i made it uh entertaining and perhaps digestible even so that's my goal right that's my goal absolutely so check out angel excuse me love that one angela langlot at trademarkdoctor.net Talk to you later. Thanks, guys. It's been fun. Bye-bye. Bye. You too. Thanks so much for joining us for the I Create Daily podcast. Please let us know what creatives you would like us to interview and what topics you would be interested in hearing more about. And if you enjoyed this show, please leave a review on iTunes. We value your feedback. We read all the reviews and it just helps us get the word out on the I Create Daily podcast. Thank you so much. Thanks so much.